So basically, the way I got into this topic was through again, like most of my questions that I come across is through my academic uh, progression. So, of course, we talk about uh, we, we were doing limits and stuff in last semester, and conversations go on to infinities and stuff like that. Yes, you start wondering what what it exactly means. Uh, so before we get into uh, the deep uh, concepts, specific concepts of mathematics. I was wondering, it's it, it must be interesting to talk about the origin of mathematics, right? So, if you were to roll back time uh, and go back like hundreds of hundreds and thousands of years, uh, there was there must be a time when numbers didn't exist, and then someone start. So people didn't start. People didn't use numbers, and then eventually people started using numbers and stuff like that. Could you could you speak a little bit about how how math has evolved over the time? Well, that I cannot speak about very much because uh, uh, I do not know that history uh, uh, very well. But I do think that it could be a bear on uh, some philosophical questions. So let me just say one thing, then maybe you can get us started. Um, so you said, as you were phrasing your question, uh, you said that there was a time when numbers didn't exist. Yeah. And then you corrected yourself and you said, uh, um, there was a time when people weren't using numbers and then they started using numbers. Uh -huh. And I'm sure this is true, but th that difference is interesting and is of philosophical relevance. Because uh, one big question that philosophers have been after is the question, what are numbers? Right. And uh, one type of answer is that uh, uh, numbers are objects that exist independently of humans mm -hmm. and um, uh, so what we do when we do even basic mathematics is uh, establish some kind of connections with these objects now uh, I can uh, uh, I can uh, punch my desk but I cannot punch the number three yeah uh, so uh, philosophers uh, who have wanted to say these things have wanted to say the numbers are abstract objects so they're things but they're not concrete things that you can interact with right. in your sort of normal experience of the world. Now, on this philosophical picture, uh, there is no time at which numbers didn't exist in some sense. Uh, uh, but there might be a time uh, where people weren't using numbers, of course. Uh, but again, I do not know uh, this kind of history. And I actually, I think it's a fascinating question. Uh, on the, of course, if you have the opposing view that numbers are something that uh, uh, I think the, uh, matic the, mathemat the mathematician uh, Richard Dedekind from the uh, 19th century said that numbers are creations of the human mind. Uh, if you have that view, then you can ask the question, well, when were they created by the human mind? Yeah, exactly. So uh, as you correctly pointed out, I, I rephrased that because I my next my very next question was, do numbers exist in the real world? And so I I, I know the uh, I know that there are uh, two different views there. But so when you talk about uh, so the the I believe it's the Platonistic view, right? So that the, yes. the numbers exist uh, are independent of the human uh, interaction with them. Correct. Um, for, uh, for for that to be true, uh, does that not pose uh, m more logistical questions? Like if they exist outside of humans, uh, I mean, what, how, where, when? Yeah, so uh, I wouldn't say, so, so in some sense, they do pose uh, questions that I would describe as logistical, uh, like, you know, where, where where is this space that they occupy? Is it overcrowded? Yeah. Uh, do they need some water in there to make sure the numbers still exist? Yeah. Uh, but there, there are a bunch of uh, uh, deep philosophy questions that emerge when you start adopting this view, which, uh, as you correctly said, is called Platonism about uh, in this case, about arithmetic, if we're talking about natural numbers. Yeah. Uh, but you, of course, you could be a Platonist about whatever branch of mathematics you wanted. You could be a Platonist about functions uh, or, you know. Uh, but th there are deep questions in this, in this area. So it's called Platonism, by the way, because uh, it seems similar to views that Plato held about universals. Mm -hmm. So Plato taught that uh, 
the thing that all red things have in common is some kind of universal, but uh, that universal exists as an abstract object, not as a concrete part of the world. And the idea of Platonist mathematics is that mathematical objects are kind of similar to this. They are uh, things that uh, uh, as, uh, exist, again, in some kind of independent reality. The, instead of thinking about the logistical question, one question that I think is, is, is really deep and uh, philosophers of mathematics who like this Platonist approach have worried about is um, how do we know anything about them? Uh, cause, so here's how you might get yourself in a frame of mind to feel the force of that objection or of that problem. Uh, it seems that most of our, ex uh, of our knowledge comes from experience. Yeah. And maybe even all of our knowledge comes from experience, right? So I know that the world is, in is in, you know, shaped in certain way uh, because sort of through my senses, I've gotten certain inputs. Then at some point I've processed those inputs and that's how I acquired a bunch of knowledge about the world. Yeah. Right? But if we are claiming that the number two is in a completely separate realm from the realm that we are connected to, how is it even possible for us to acquire any knowledge about the numbers? Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's that's one of the deepest puzzles in philosophy of mathematics. Now, uh, there are roughly two different answers that Platonists give about, and each of them kind of have a hero uh, uh, from the history of logic and philosophy of mathematics. Uh, the one hero is the uh, philosopher Gottlob Frege, who wrote also in the uh, oh, and mathematician. He also wrote in the 19th century and did uh, truly transformational work for philosophy of mathematics mm -hmm. and um, and philosophy of language. Uh, Frege published a book in 1884 called uh, uh, "The Foundations of Arithmetic," which is kind of a short book, uh, which. Uh, I, I really would recommend uh, as a as a as a reading. It's it's not super technical. At least most of it is not super technical, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's kind of a manifesto for his position. It's it's about hundred pages of him uh, laying down the big principles uh, for for this kind of approach, and his thought was roughly this. He thought that uh, uh, our reason gives us the capacity to perform logical reasoning mm -hmm. and because mathematics can be reduced to logic so he thought that all of mathematics could be reduced to logic uh, we can know mathematical truths by the same means that we know the truths of logic yeah. right so suppose i tell you about a new object and we're going to call it a, a blug mm -hmm. and i tell you uh the blug is either green or it's not green Right. You know that that is true without really having any experience of the world. Yeah. And so sort of Frege thought that if you defined the numbers, uh, uh, well, if you define the numerals correctly, and uh, uh, you would get a grasp of the concepts of the numbers, and then mathematical truths would actually be theorems in a system of logic. Mm -hmm. And if there were theorems in a system of logic, then whatever story you tell about how you know the truths of logic mm -hmm. would carry over to whatever story you tell about how you know the truths of mathematics. Makes sense. Uh, so, but when you talk about, uh, so yeah, this is one view that uh, the numbers are, uh, numbers are, I mean, mathematics can be broken down to logic and yes. initially and eventually. Maybe. It was a difficult project, and I think most people regard it as having failed, I should say. Oh. Because, uh, uh, so I said, this book that I, that I recommended right now uh, is supposed to be kind of the, the, the big picture, you know, the, the advertisement for The View. Then Frege wrote, uh, wrote uh, uh, another, a much bigger book huh? uh, called The Basic Laws of Arithmetic, in which he tried to spell out exactly how the reduction of... Uh, uh, mathematics to logic was going to go, including analysis. He wasn't limiting himself to arithmetic. Uh, but then he, uh, 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 Russell, uh, in the early 20th century, pointed out that there was an inconsistency uh, at the at this center of Frege's system, which you might have heard of as Russell's paradox. Uh, and uh, once once that happens, 
there was a lot of work in this area called the foundations of mathematics. And just to make this story short, uh, I, I think a common view right now is that there is no reduction of mathematics to logic, even though there are principles, uh, sorry, there are people who roughly in the last 20 to 30 years have been trying to revive uh, parts of that Frege program. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, and so another position that I had heard uh, in this in this similar area was about how numbers are not abstract objects, but they're just properties of objects. So when you say like one apple, mm. apple three apples, uh, they're just like properties of, of, of that set or bunch of apples, like its color, like its taste, like its uh, stuff like that. So what, what do you what do you think about that? So you could say that. Uh... Uh, actually, in fact, that was kind of uh, Frege's view, because actually Frege thought that uh, numbers were properties of concepts. Okay. So he thought that, uh, well, anyway, let's, let's set this up. Let me just uh, speak straight to your question. Um, you could say that, but in a way it pushes the question of Platonism uh, back one step. Because if you tell me that numbers are properties, then the next question I'm going to ask you is, what are properties? Yeah. Uh, and if your answer is that properties are abstract objects, well, then we're back to Platonism. Yeah. Uh, if your answer is that properties are something else, then whatever. But uh, uh, I guess my reaction to that thought right now is that uh, that view cannot really be evaluated without thinking about the next question of what are properties. Makes sense. Right. The main rivals to, sorry, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but the main rival to Platonism is a view that's called nominalism, or actually it's a, it's a bunch of views called nominalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and nominalists in various ways uh, want to say that mathematical objects like numbers do not exist. Okay. Uh, one version of nominalism that is particularly prominent uh, is called fictionalism. Is, and according to fictionalism, uh, mathematics is something like a robust fiction, right? And uh, there may be truths in the fiction uh, that uh, um, that are not really truths in our world, but they're just truths in the fiction. Just like if I said, you know, the world of in the world of Game of Thrones, there are no cars, right? right? Uh, then I'm using an operator in the world of Game of Thrones to talk about the world of Game of Thrones, yeah. but. Uh, but so uh, uh, the the issue that I have with that uh, approach is that mathematics seems to beautifully explain so much about the universe. Yes. Uh, and so if 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 you tell me that it's something just fictionally created, it's a little bit difficult for me to accept that because of how uncanny uh, it is in, in in solving so many. This is an excellent issue, and uh, this is this is one of the uh, one of the classic problems for. Uh, uh, for nominalists, uh, uh, it's philosophers call it the problem of the applicability of mathematics, uh, and uh, uh, you know. Uh, so one way of bringing the problem out, if you just continue that analogy, there may be truths about the world of Game of Thrones that do not carry over to our world, right? We do not use facts about the world of Game of Thrones to explain anything in our world. Yeah. Uh, by contrast. Uh, mathematics is useful everywhere, right? So an example that I sort of had in mind that I wanted to bring up is, uh, so uh, think about uh, Newton's universal law of gravitation, right? You know, that seems to do a reasonably good job in capturing the uh, magnitude of a gravitational attraction between two bodies, uh, you know, but it makes reference to numbers. There is a reference to a gravitational constant. Uh, there is a reference to the uh, masses of bodies. Uh, and those are numbers. There is a reference to the square of the distance. That's a number. Uh, and so, you know, uh, it, you wouldn't phrase the law of universe, universal law of gravitation in terms of features of the Game of Thrones world. Why are you phrasing the uh, universal law of gravitation in terms of uh, bits of mathematics? Now, uh, nominalists have strategies that, uh, uh, that they, things that they want to say in response to this. Uh, so, uh, uh, a, a contemporary philosopher named Hartree Field uh, 
published a book in 1980 called Science Without Numbers. And the thesis of Science Without Numbers was that actually you could rewrite uh, Newtonian mechanics without numbers at all. Oh. Uh, and so basically on that picture, uh, numbers really are just uh, shorthands mm -hmm. uh, for, for things mm -hmm. uh, that you could express without numbers, but they're more conveniently expressed with numbers. Yeah. So yeah, uh, so if I if I were to think about it, uh, sort of back to my very first question about the origin of mathematics, even I, I don't know uh, the exact details, but I assume it would be something like uh, we first come up with the integers uh, to talk about uh, how how much I mean I give yes. you apples, you give me two bananas, stuff like that. Then we start dealing with money, and so society evolves. We start dealing with money. Uh, before that, in fact, we distribute stuff, we divide stuff, so we get fractions, we get rational numbers. Yes. Then eventually we start talking about money, we do transactions uh, and negative numbers come up. Then we start doing geometry, we, we start making circles, pi comes up, uh, root 2 comes up. So yes. what, 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 what it seems to me is uh, that this becomes sort of a progressive system uh, in uh, to help us understand or uh, rather to help us understand the universe uh, uh, and, in, yes. and in dealing with stuff and so uh, I've heard people I've heard physicists and scientists talk about how math mathematics is the language of the universe uh, and how it, it helps us uh, understand it, it's a system created in order for us to uh, understand the universe better yes yeah what do you think about that uh, well, I, I think that may be, uh, you know, I was just reading, by the way, this uh, sci-fi trilogy. Do, have you heard about this uh, three-body problem uh, trilogy? It's a, it's a very, it's a very, uh, 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 I, I feel like I have to say this world, this world, even though it's in the blurb of the book, it's a very imaginative sci-fi story. Yeah. Uh, the, which includes uh, contact with alien civilizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, one of the themes of the story is that uh, sort of basic facts about mathematics and physics would be the kinds of basic facts that we should expect an alien civilization to uh, know. Yeah. Uh, so they're kind of invariant uh, across right. uh, sort of imagined alien species. Uh -huh. uh, so I think Something like that may be true, but I don't think it settles the question of the existence of numbers. Right. Right. So, because because what somebody what somebody like Field would want to say, Field is the guy who was saying this uh, science without numbers project, is that uh, this this body of work, uh, so this, this this body of tools, the the mathematical tools, uh, are tools that do work to systematize. Uh, things that are already sort of part of the real world, right? So, uh, you know, actually, one way to think about it is sort of uh, think again about the 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 universal gravitational constant, right? So, so this is a number. But it's a number that's measuring something that is not a number, yeah. right? It's measuring uh, uh, some relationships between various things in the universe. Mm -hmm. And um, so you could use a, a, a term that refers to a number to refer to it. Right. Uh, but that doesn't settle that the number exists. The important thing that you want to talk about is their relationships. You don't want to talk about the number, you know, the, the important thing about the gravitational constant is not the 6.673, whatever times uh, 10 to the minus 11, the number is not important, okay. right? Uh, it's what's important is the, the thing, the feature of reality that's being measured, right. right? So if I have two sticks, let's make it simpler. If I have two sticks and one is twice as long as the other, yeah. I could say that uh, sort of the length of the second stick is two times the length of the first stick. Yeah. Uh, but the reality I'm measuring doesn't need the numbers for its res description, right. right? The numbers make the description convenient sometimes. 
uh, but the reality itself, you could say, uh, uh, just as those relationship between the magnitudes, like one stick being longer than the other stick. Yeah. Uh, but again, I don't, I don't need to talk about the numbers to say that thing. Yeah, it is, what I'm trying to say, I think, is uh, if if am I if I'm getting it right, is uh, numbers are just a way to conveniently and efficiently talk about things uh, and make and have that's right precise, precise conversations, which is yeah. So if 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 we were talking, uh, yeah, if we were talking just uh, casually about if this stick is longer than this stick, we could simply say that this stick is longer. That's right. But if uh, we want to, let's say, construct a building, uh, we'd, we'd have to say stuff like this, this stick is twice as long as the the, the other stick in, because of which we need to use this stick. So, I, well, I, you wouldn't even have to say that. You could say it in the longer way. It would just be enormously inconvenient right, to do that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, and so, yeah, we can't uh, talk about numbers and uh, philosophy of mathematics and not yes. infinity. Uh, so the concept yes. of uh, infinity uh, to me it seems like infinity be is infinity a real thing or is it just a mathematical fiction well I, I think this question is uh, I should say is not separate from the questions that we've been discussing uh -huh. uh, so again if you're a Platonist you're like I've already bought into the existence of uh, two and three. Uh, I've bought into the existence of sets. Why shouldn't I buy into the existence of infinite sets, for instance? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a sense in which once you're in this uh, fabulous land of uh, abstract things, you know, the toys keep coming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, it, the only reason why you would stop on this picture before uh, assuming the existence of inf infinite objects or, or infinite sets mm -hmm. is uh, um, is if you thought there was a contradiction. Okay. Right. Uh, but most people don't think there is a contradiction to asserting, for instance that there is a set containing all the natural numbers. Right. Right. So uh, that once that argument is out the window, uh, uh, why would you, as a Platonist, deny the existence of infinities? Right. Now, of course, uh, on the other hand, if you're a nominalist, you could, you could say, well, uh, this, this talk about infinity uh, is uh, it's a huge, uh, presents a bunch of problems. Uh, you know, it's just as bad, you know, from the point of view of reality yeah. as the talk, uh, about, uh, the sort of finite quantities, uh, sort of finite numbers. Right. And maybe it's worse in that sort of talking about infinity comes with its own, uh, battery of paradoxes and problems, yeah. right? I, I, I don't even think you need to go that far, right? So, uh, um, sorry, uh, I, 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 I don't, I don't want to start a new discussion. Let, let me just point you to something that sort of there is an entry that I was trying to get in. So there is a resource in philosophy, which I recommend to everybody, which is the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have an entry on mathematical infinity, okay. uh, which is fantastic. It's uh, by a few uh, friends of mine who are, uh, I mean, they're not writing there as friends of mine, uh, but uh, uh, what happened? I've lost it. I should have gotten a link to it. Let me see. Give me one second. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, I can't really find it right now. Of course, this is... Uh, Anyway, uh, there's a, there, it's a bunch of philosophers who have written about their favorite problems about infinity. Okay. Uh, and uh, 
some of them, like some of these problems, uh, emerge uh, if you already when you're doing things like probability theory or something like this, right? So if you say, uh, uh, if you think that there is a space of possible outcomes uh, that is uh, sort of uh, uncountably infinite, and then you imagine, uh, you know, uh, uh, drawing a random one point from the space, you'd have to say that that has probability zero. Yeah. Uh, right. And, uh, uh, but then you wonder, well, sort of how could it be uh, that, uh, you know, this sort of the sum, these this things, uh, uh, each of them have measure zero, but they, uh, they collectively sum up to something bigger than zero. Yeah. Uh, of course, we have theories that make complete sense of that, uh, but those theories sort of are acquisition, right? So there's a lot of work that went into clarifying those concepts uh, to make it less paradoxical. So, so one, one thing that might restrain you is if you thought, well, infinity poses special problems and uh, we want to avoid those problems. Right. Uh, and so uh, when we talk about infinity, uh, so I, maybe I'm digressing a little bit, but yes. so when you talked about that, the thing that came to my mind is all those weird proofs that you see of one equals two and one equals zero, which have uh, to do with stuff like dividing by zero and stuff like that. Be yes. Because of those uh, tricky areas, we can prove absurd things in mathematics. And I was just wondering if you talk about, uh, let's say things like uh, one upon zero uh, and why it doesn't make sense to do that. I have, I have read explanations saying that imagine uh, you have one apple and you're trying to divide it between zero people. It's it's absurd to think about that. But so uh, what what I'm trying to think uh, in this way is that 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 is then the view that mathematics is comes from uh, from from the real world. Uh, how does if if mathematics was simply a system that was created, then dividing by zero should not have been that big of an issue. Uh, am I making sense? <laughs> Well, in the case of dividing by zero, I think the problem is that uh, you get a bunch of contradictions if you allow division by zero. Right. So, uh, uh, really, what I, my my the question I'm trying to get at is uh, is 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 the system of mathematics consistent? Have we gotten to ha, have we come across some areas where we find out that uh, the the axioms on which we have based stuff and the theories that we have proved, theorems that we proved using those axioms uh, has that created some some sort of inconsistencies yet and is there a, if not is there a possibility that it could so okay so this is a tricky question uh, uh, let me say uh, this much um There are some theories in mathematics which we are fairly confident are consistent. Okay. Uh, but I don't think there is a proof of consistency, period. Because okay. among many things, it's not clear what shape that proof would take. Right. Uh, so, because what we do, for instance, in logic, is to prove that various things are consistent relative to each other. So that means you could prove that a certain theory is consistent. I don't know if set theory is, if the classical set theory is consistent. Right. Uh, but there are sort of inherent limits to our ability to prove consistency period, okay. to prove that something is consistent and that's it. Yeah. Um, so the best we can do is have very strong confidence that some theories that we are relying on mm -hmm. are consistent. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, an example is uh, the basic axiomatization of arithmetic, which is called piano arithmetic. We tend to think that's a consistent theory, but the way we think that's a consistent theory is in some way, the way in which scientists might uh, hold some very basic facts say about physics right. right so if you're a fine scientist who have you have a physical theory you don't think necessarily that your theory is uh true uh you know or proven true you just think it's supported by 
a, a number of facts yeah. uh, and a number of observations. And in mathematics, it's hard to think of supported by supported by a number of observations. Uh, but there is such a thing as being fairly confident that certain theories are uh, consistent. So how how do we know that we're what makes us fairly confident? Well, every now and then somebody comes up with a proof of the inconsistency of piano arithmetic. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, usually the pattern of these things is most of these proofs uh, are found to be uh, gappy or otherwise problematic. Yeah. And so that gives you some more confidence uh, to believe that uh, the theory is consistent, yeah. right? Uh, but but there is no mathematical proof that piano arithmetic is consistent or basic set theory. And once you do accept one of those as consistent, you can actually start proving the consistency of a bunch of things relative to them. Uh, but uh, uh, so there is a sense in which uh, you need these uh, this more scientific attitude towards mathematical theory. Right. And here I, I want to plug the work of a friend of mine about this because. Uh, um, you mentioned axioms. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, there is this philosopher, uh, among other things of mathematics, he does all kinds of things, uh, named Kenny Warren, who was in graduate school with me. And uh, he was uh, uh, first at uh, University of Southern California and now at Texas A&M. And uh, he uh, has a paper in which he asks the question, what are axioms? Uh -huh. What are axioms for? Uh, and the classical view of axioms is that axioms are sort of inherently obvious statements, like things that we found out to be basically true, uh, and that's what we're relying on. Uh, but is Warren is saying that's not the correct view of axioms. Uh, uh, he thinks that uh, axioms are statements that mathematicians who have different philosophical conceptions or different views about the meanings of whatever bits of mathematics uh, they're using uh, can agree on uh, to uh, from a variety of positions. So his thought is that uh, the point of axioms is to paper over differences. It's not to uh, be the things that everybody agrees. Well, they are the things that everybody agrees with, but not because they're obviously true, uh, but because everyone has their own reason for uh, thinking that this statement uh -huh. is something that can be relied on. Okay. And so uh, uh, then that's what makes, so th th you could kind of think of it as a, almost as a, uh, social or disagreement based theory of action, uh, axioms. It's like, we don't want to talk about what it means to add one to a number. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to state something in a language that is neutral behind, you know, between our different points of view and hope that everybody can agree to it. So. Uh, that would be a kind of conception of axioms uh, that also goes hand in hand with this attitude that I was recommending about the consistency of theories, which is don't think that there is anything proven true or anything, any facts about consistency that are sort of uh, established. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, talking about axioms a little bit more, uh, just for, for the clarification. Uh, yes. Could you, could you give some examples of some basic axioms of arithmetic, for example? Yeah, so the sort of axioms of arithmetic, sort of, they will tell you things like uh, zero is not a successor uh, in, uh, in the natural numbers, right? Okay. Or they will tell you uh, every number has a successor. Right. Right. So what I was saying earlier is sort of you could have different philosophical views of what zero is. Right. Right. Uh, but the is Warren theory is you just write down the statement zero is not a successor. Everybody can agree to it, whatever they mean by zero. Right. Uh, you know, maybe some people that think that zero is a group of Pokemons uh, hanging, uh, hanging out in my yard that I can catch with my phone. It doesn't matter what they think zero is, as long as they agree that zero is not a successor. Oh. Um, and uh, so then the other axioms of arithmetic are there's axioms that govern uh, uh, addition. So for instance, there's the axioms that says that uh, 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 the successor uh, of x plus y is equal to x plus the successor of y. So these are basic axioms or, or there's uh, axioms that tell you that uh, uh, a x plus zero equals x, x times one equals x. Uh, 
Uh, so general uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, ax algebraic axioms about those operations, mm -hmm. and then the most important axiom is the induction principle, uh, which uh, uh, tells you that if you have a property that holds of zero and holds of uh, if it holds of a number, it holds of the successor of that number, then the property holds of all the natural numbers. Uh, okay. uh, so, so but that but this is a uh, it's a fairly controversial principle because depending on how strong your logic is. Uh, there's going to be various degrees of strength in which you can write this down. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, because I, the reason I asked this is because uh, while researching about this uh, topic, I came across a few peop uh, a few points of view talking about how uh, if so in mathematics, uh, uh, would I be right in saying that these axioms are uh, unprovable truths? Um... <laughs> They're, in a sense, they are unprovable. If you, again, so let, let me be careful here. Um, so, whether they are truths uh, is again, this is a it's a philosophically laden thing. Right. Right. So think about the statement: zero is not a successor. Mm -hmm. If that is true, uh -huh. right? Uh, that means that zero must exist. Right. Uh, right. Uh, uh, so that already has decided the issue of Platonism versus nominalism. Right. Uh, so nominalists want to say, no, actually, that statement is false. It's like saying that Santa Claus is not an American citizen. Uh, that's uh, uh, that's false, not because Santa Claus is an American citizen. It's just false because there is no Santa Claus. Right. right? Uh, so. Uh, so you can't really call them truths. That's why I sort of saying sort of these Warren theories that there are things that we can agree on, mm -hmm. but agreeing on doesn't necessarily mean for everybody believe that they're true. Right. Right. We just use them as starting points. Uh -huh. Now the bit about them being unprovable, that's interesting. Uh, because unprovable always makes reference to a system. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so you can, nothing is unprovable period awesome. yeah uh you, you gotta be provable or unprovable relative to some background theory right right so for instance relative to the theory uh that includes those axioms there is a sense in which they are unprovable except in the trivial way that everything is provable from itself <laughs> uh so there, there is there you know there is a trivial kind of proof where i assume a proposition p and I say, well, then P, <laughs> right? So, uh, but if you want to exclude that kind of proof, if you want to think of a true proof, mm -hmm. uh, uh, whatever that means, because that's that's a controversial thing, um, then the axioms you you could view them as uh, untrue. Uh, I'm sorry, as uh, as unprovable. That's what I meant. Um. Let me make sure that I, that is still so. So yeah. So, but then even if they're improvable relative to that theory, they may still be provable relative to another theory, right? right? So, for instance, Frege's point uh, that I was mentioning earlier on when I was saying he was trying to reduce mathematics to logic. Yeah. Uh, the precise form that uh, his uh, uh, his method was taking was he was trying to prove the axioms of arithmetic from basic logical principles. Mm -hmm. So he was trying to say, these axioms can be proven from my system of logic. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's my system of logic. And here's the definitions that allows me to prove those axioms. Right. Yeah, and so uh, we, we talked a lot about proofs and stuff. Uh, I, I've heard people talk about, I've heard mathematicians talk about a proof being beautiful and elegant. Yeah. And I wonder what 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 it exactly means. I mean, how does beauty play a role in, in proofs? Because, I mean, we talk about proofs being elegant and beautiful if they are simple to understand, easy to, easy to grasp. But does that have any effect on the on the validity of the proof rather uh, i mean if a proof is uh, what what does it mean for a proof to be uh, beautiful 
uh, you have done an amazing amount of research or amazing an amazing quality of research for this podcast, I should say, because I had I had an outline of topics I wanted to talk about uh, and you are hitting on all of them <laughs> and uh, I, I'm not even uh, sort of trying to uh, bring them up. Uh, uh, so there is a there is a, a field in mathematics that uh, is a, a subfield, sorry, in the philosophy of mathematics, mm -hmm. which is devoted to understanding the concept of uh, uh, mathematical explanation, which is connected to this thing about beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, you might think, well, in some sense, beauty, you know, who cares about beauty? If I can prove something, I've proven it, that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is such a thing as uh, a proof that gives you insight into a result and a proof that doesn't, right? So earlier I was mentioning the proof of P from P itself, yeah. right? That's a proof, like, the, you know, but it's not a very insightful proof. It doesn't tell you much. Uh, uh, you've not learned very much. Uh, one thing that you can sometimes, you sometimes see uh, is that the proofs that are deemed beautiful, what that means is they're based on principles that have a strong ability to explain a variety of interrelated results. Okay. Uh, right, so now my... Uh, let me give you an example that, I mean, now not as fresh in my mind as it normally would be if I was teaching philosophy of mathematics, but... Uh, 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 this example was given to me, by the way, by by a philosopher of mathematics at Berkeley named Paolo Mancoso, who uh, has kind of devoted his career to thinking about the philosophy of mathematics uh, from a point of view that is uh, closer to mathematical practice. So a lot of philosophers look at mathematics as in, you know, whatever mathematicians are doing, we're going to think about what the number two is. And then mathematicians don't really care about this question, what the number two is. Uh, but Mancoso has tried to base his career again uh, uh, on the idea of now we gotta have a philosophy of mathematics that's the kind of thing a mathematician would take seriously because yeah. mathematicians don't care about whether the number two exists. Yeah, uh, you will find this out when you ask the the <laughs> mathematician in this conversation. Yeah. And so, uh, so Mancoso teaches a class in which one unit is on uh, explanation, and you read this paper by. This uh, another 19th century mathematician named Bolzano. Uh -huh. And this is a paper in which Bolzano is proving the uh, intermediate value theorem uh, in analysis, which is a theorem that roughly tells you uh, that if you have uh, sort of a continuous function, uh, you know, that has values, but you, you know this theorem, but yeah. I, I'll just say just for the uh, sake of your audience, that has kind of values between sort of two points, uh, then, uh, you're going to have to hit the values in between, right? Very roughly. Mm -hmm. uh, or for instance, if you, one way to think about it is uh, if you have a continuous function that has a positive value and a negative value, then at some point you got to cross the X axis. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and then Bol Bolzano, the early bits of this paper, Bolzano goes like, well, uh, why is this true? Well, some people think that a continuous function is a function that, uh, uh, you know, when you draw the graph of it, you never lift the pencil from your paper. Uh, and so, of course, if you're going from the negative part of your graph to the positive part of your graph, yeah. you got to cross the x-axis at some point. Uh -huh. Right. But then he says, this is kind of a crappy proof because uh, we don't want to think about pencils when we're doing proofs in mathematics. Yeah. Um, so then what he does, he gives the epsilon delta definitions of continuity that you would learn in a in sort of normal analysis class yeah. and then he proves the intermediate value theorem from those uh, by means of a logical proof uh, with those definitions uh, so you know you define the continuous functions as the functions with this sort of for all uh, for all epsilon there is a delta or whatever no the other way for all delta there is an epsilon whatever, whichever way you define it uh, and then he goes you know what we could also have defined the continuous functions as exactly the functions that satisfy the intermediate value theorem. Right. Uh, uh, but that proof is also not very good because it doesn't explain the intermediate value theorem. Yeah. 
Uh, whereas the proof that we have given does explain the intermediate value theorem. So I guess one thing that I want to point out here is uh, one way of thinking about this stuff about beauty in mathematics is as tied to mathematical explanation. Oh. Sorry, so the beautiful proofs are the ones that explain a bunch of stuff. Uh, uh, and so that makes it less psychological, right? Because the other concept of beauty would be very psychological, where I can find something beautiful, you don't find it beautiful, okay. you know, so who cares now? Uh, but if you think this has to do with quality of explanation, then you can start getting a vibe where it's like, okay, actually there is something to this talk of mathematical beauty. It really is kind of a disguised way of talking about explanation, what explains what. Yeah. Right. And, uh, uh, but then there is a puzzle about math mathematical explanation too, because uh, uh, again, in the real world, often when we explain things, we give causal explanations. So that means we explain, uh, you know, if you, if I ask you, uh, why is my daughter's dress covered with food, mm -hmm. right? The answer to that question is something about the causes of the state of the world. Right. right. So the, the kinds of things that brought this state of the world about. Mm -hmm. But that can't be what's going on with mathematical explanation. Right. Uh, it can't be that uh, um, sort of one thing uh, caused, I don't know, uh, uh, all prime numbers greater than uh, two to be odd. Right. There is there is no causation there. Yeah. Uh, so an explanation of that fact is probably something that reduces it to more basic facts. Mm -hmm. And when you get into this picture, you now start having a picture of differences in basicness between uh, uh, different kinds of mathematical facts. So Bolzano, for instance, thought, you know, arithmetic is more basic than analysis. Logic is more basic than arithmetic. Yeah. And so when you reduce one to the other, you've, you've explained things. Uh, sorry, this is some number. Yeah. Uh, I'm at the one button studio in Stam. Um, okay. They have a... you're, you're out of time? Oh, no, no. Uh, someone just interrupted for some reason. Okay, that's fine. Uh, sorry, sorry to cut you off. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat what you said? A few minutes? No, what I was saying is uh, th so there's this question of what. Uh, mathematical explanation uh, could be if it's not causal explanation. Yeah. And what some people think is that mathematical ex explanation is a matter of uh, uh, relating facts uh, uh, with more basic facts. Right. Uh, yeah. So one question that I have uh, about that is uh, how granular, how do we decide how granular we want to go to? Uh, like uh, the the thing that you said about uh, prime numbers, uh, yes. prime numbers greater than two are odd. Uh, how how basic do you? Uh, how do we decide where do we draw the line of saying that these are the basic facts and using those basic facts we will prove other facts? Yeah, no, that's good. Now that fact that I just that was just something that came to mind as I yeah. was speaking. As you know, it's probably not something that requires explanation. Mm -hmm. Although that it's also an interesting question. Uh, what requires explanation, right? Uh, uh, but you might think there are general facts about the natural numbers uh, that require explanation. And then there, you're exactly right. There's this question, uh, what makes it the case that some facts are more basic than others? Yeah. Um, and one possibility that we should keep in mind here is that this is all, it's also all psychology, that there isn't really uh, so this would kind of undermine this research program, but there isn't really a fact of the matter about uh, which facts are more basic. Uh -huh. uh, I had a, a, a student uh, who was a, my undergraduate student when I just started being a professor and now he's a professor. Uh, uh, so that's, that's how old I am. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and uh, he wrote his... Uh, he wrote two honors thesis uh, with me, uh, one with me and one with another person in Northwestern. And one of the projects was about uh, the psychology of mathematical proof, yeah. uh, which ended up being a bunch of publishable papers. And uh, 
actually published papers. Uh, his name is Sam Johnson. He's, uh, he works in, uh, in, in, in psychology, but I think he works in a business school. And he had experiments where he was asking people, for instance, uh, whether uh, two times two explains two plus two or vice versa, or, or, or two plus two explains two times two. Right. And his general finding was that people uh, tend to prefer uh, addition as the basic explainer over explanation. Uh, but you might think, how could this be a fact in the world uh, or, or rather than just a preference that we all share because mm -hmm. uh, we've been indoctrinated in a certain way? It seems bizarre to think, uh, maybe it doesn't seem that bizarre. Anyway, the, 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 the thought of somebody who thought that there were uh, relationships in the world here would be so similar to causal relationship right. would be uh, to claim that uh, you know there's some fact about how reality is arranged such that uh, uh, you know two plus two is more basic than two times two yeah uh, does that not also have to do with uh, with the history of mathematics uh, for example I mean it might yes weren't we doing addition before we were doing multiplication just because of the mere complex complexity of the possibly you're pointing uh, uh, me to my ignorance of the history and again, I, I wish i knew more about this I, i'm not sure it's true that we were doing addition before multiplication i mean, I mean it I makes sense think that was true but yeah, yeah it could also <laughs> be another uh, another example of how how psychologically we are no exactly exactly it, it makes sense that it, that's one thing it would make sense that people started adding before they started multiplying that's certainly how my daughter is being taught in elementary school exactly. uh but i don't know uh i uh i'm sure there is uh, uh historians of mathematics that have done comprehensive work on this yeah. uh and uh um i, I just i'm sorry i'm I will not speak about my ignorance uh, of this anymore, uh, but it, it might have something to do with that. But I, you might still ask, well, what does this have to do with explanatory, explanatoriness? Right. Just because uh, we didn't think about it, uh, uh, it doesn't mean that it's more basic or less basic. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, yeah, and also uh, another thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, drawing the comparisons between mathematics and languages um, yes right uh, and so we see that there are uh, some similarities and some differences uh, what 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 do you think are the biggest similarities and differences between uh tell me more uh, uh, uh. basically uh, what i'm trying to get at is uh, how i've heard people talk about mathematics being like a language like numbers being letters and equations being words and proofs being essays stuff like that uh, and so does this uh, what i'm trying to say is uh, would it be right to say that mathematics is sort of a language which is way more precise uh, way more our definitions are way more clearer than let's say any other any other language yeah so so we're now comparing let me see if i if i understand correctly we're comparing the language of mathematics uh, -huh. uh with the languages that we speak in everyday life uh so uh we're comparing um so let me let me say something uh uh, up first to frame the question and then I'll sort of try to speak a little bit more to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a sense, when we talk about the language of mathematics, mm -hmm. uh, we got to be a little bit uh, careful to make sure what we're talking about. So one thing is the say the language the mathematicians speak when they're doing mathematics, uh -huh. right? That language usually is a mix of whatever natural language they speak. So, you know, in the case of our professors, probably English, mm -hmm. uh, plus uh, some formal bits. Right. 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 So, I don't know. A professor comes into the analysis class, wants to prove the intermediate value theorem, 
uh, sets up some things about the continuous function, tells a couple of jokes. You know, all, all of that is happening in the in this hybrid language. But I don't think that's what you're talking about. You're thinking about imagine a formal language uh, that's the language that captures uh, all the facts about, say, analysis uh, and uh, no other facts. It's just designed to do that job. Yeah. Uh, kind of like uh, um, I don't know. you could have a, well, l let me not go on a digression. So that's what we're comparing with natural language. So then there was this question, how does that compare uh, with uh, ordinary, ordinary languages? One one old style view was uh, well, uh, it's not so good for the ordinary languages because they are riddled with confusions, they're riddled with vagueness. Uh, you know, I say I'm gonna be arriving late to our appointment, but I'm not telling you exactly what millisecond I am arriving at. Uh, and uh, so there's a sense in which this language uh, doesn't really. Um, it's not set up to have that kind of precision. Mm -hmm. And you might even think some parts of the language, uh, the na natural language, are not just vague, maybe some parts are incoherent or something like that. Uh, so, so yes, you could have a view like this. Uh, another view you could have, though, is that uh, underneath uh, this, uh, uh, this, this uh, sort of confusing surface, uh, there is a kind of structure that is not that different from the structure of a formal language. Right. So right now I'm, I'm teaching a class in which uh, we are teaching this, uh, it's a logic class in which we are teaching, teaching some of the work of this uh, philosopher named Richard Montague. Mm -hmm. And Montague was famous for his claim that uh, sort of fundamentally uh, English can be understood as having the backbone of a formal language. And then at some point you're going to explain all these other features, uh, uh, like, I don't know, vagueness or whatnot, yeah. or and context dependence and all the other stuff that we do with language at some level. But there is a basic level at which uh, uh, um, natural language has the structure of a mathematical language. Yeah. And uh, one way in which this comes up uh, is this idea that you can think of complex expressions of a natural language as having a structure that it's dependent on the structure of its component expressions. Right. Uh, and, and so, for instance, if I say, uh, uh, John eats, right? I could think of that as having two parts. I'm going to assign a meaning uh, independently to both of these parts. I'm going to think that eat uh, is a function, corresponds to a function uh, from, uh, uh, say, objects to truth values. Right. I'm going to think that John corresponds to an object. Uh, and then I'm going to say that when I compose John uh, with eat, what I do is I apply the eat function to John and I get the truth value sort of true, let's say, because John eats. Yeah. Right. So, uh, this is, a, is an incredibly productive research par paradigm, and in fact, it's the kind of paradigm that I do most of my research in. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, the roots of this paradigm, by the way, also go back to Frege, the guy who was, telling, was doing the philosophy of mathematics, because he was one of the first people to, ha to express this idea uh, that natural languages could be understood as having uh, this uh, compositional structure. Uh, and. Uh, and then Montague was the person who actually claimed, uh, well, let's just try to think of English just as a formal language. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so this uh, next part of it is maybe a little bit of a digression from the topic. Yes. But uh, I'm, I'm really interested because uh, as a student uh, and you also are an educator, uh, and I, I was just wondering, why, why is it that some people are good at maths and some people are bad at maths? Is it just because of the way we teach it? Uh, or is, is there something something inherently... Uh, something about it that makes some people good at it and some people bad at it? All right, I'm going to take a meta approach to this question. 
which is, this is the kind of question you should never speculate about. <laughs> okay. uh, so what you need, because um, the reason you should never speculate about this question is it's oh, so easy to let whatever prejudice you have uh, uh, seep into your answer to the question. Um, so this questions about whether there are sort of, let's say, uh, innate differences in, uh, let's say, mathematical ability. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the way I think about it is a question for empirical psychology. And the only way to address it is to try to do sort of systematic unbiased work. And I, I do not know the answer sort of to the question. In practice, though, so in the practice of somebody who teaches mathematics or mathematical formalism, I tend to think that uh, uh, the belief that somebody has some kind of natural obstacle to learn mathematics uh, does generally more harm than good. Yeah. Uh, and that, uh, uh, so whatever the underlying facts, uh, it's not a great idea to foster a culture in which we divide people in the ones uh, sort of that have sort of good mathematical raw talent and good and bad mathematical raw talent, whatever that could possibly mean. Uh -huh. So, uh, so that, that's that's how I would approach this. And in many cases, so I see this in many classes that I teach. There, it's it's unfortunately frequent in these classes that there are some people that tell me like you know. I, you know, I, I always feel dumb when I take mathematical classes and uh, um, and I think in nearly every case, uh, uh, this is wrong. Uh, and, and the reason it's wrong is uh, what makes, uh, and even if, well, what makes them believe that is being next to people who are a few pages ahead, right? right? So, uh, I, I, let me give you an analogy. Uh, I, I, I take, I've been taking a, a lot of tennis lessons in the last five years, and I've progressed from uh, roughly beginner to fairly advanced, mm. right? And when I'm in these drills, I see a lot of people who hit tennis balls better than I do, yeah. right? And actually, at whatever level I am, I see people who hit tennis balls uh, uh, better than I do. Uh, but it, I think it would be incorrect for me to focus on whether there are innate athletic differences between me and these people or something like this. It's, I'd rather focus on uh, what do the people who are hitting better than I am do that I'm not doing uh, that, that can make me advance. And in many cases, they don't have like better athletic raw talent than I have. Whatever is going on is that they have more practice because... I started playing tennis at 36, uh, I'm, now, I'm now 42, and so I haven't been playing for that long. Uh, and uh, many, many of these people have been playing for, from, from childhood. Uh, do they have more, more tennis talent than I do? Probably not. Probably they've just been playing for 20 years or whatever. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that was an amazing conversation. Okay.